Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I think we're going to get started now. Thank you very much for coming. It's really great to have you all here. Um, today, we're going to talk about setting up a direct sales enterprise, and I've got four great panelists here. Um, so my name's Annie. Uh, I have a few different jobs. I actually work full-time on a farm near Sirencester. Um, we have yeah, grass-fed cows, heritage grains, the market garden. So I'm doing a little bit of this myself, but it's very much in its infancy. So I'm going to be deferring to the experts here. <laughs> um, but today I'm wearing my Pasture for Life hat. So a few years ago, I wrote a toolkit on how to set up a direct sales enterprise and interviewed lots of farmers from the Pasture for Life network um, and brought their experiences together to help people set up um, their own local marketing strategy. Um, we turned it into a series of webinars uh, funded by the Landworkers Alliance that are on YouTube. Um, and Jimmy twisted my arm and said, let's do a session at Groundswell. So I gingerly agreed and here we are. <laughs> Uh, I ended up um, also collaborating with Pete from Ubi, um, so Pete applied to do a session in the same vein, um, so we thought it would be good to join forces, um, and uh, Pete is the founder of Ubi, which is an online marketplace uh, for selling uh, seasonal, local and ecologically sound food, um, so he supports uh, lots of people to get their produce out there. Um, We've also got uh, Bob Mayhew from the Apricot Centre. Um, he's a permaculture uh, practitioner um, and ha runs a veg box business, which he's scaled up himself. Um, we've got Abby from Piper's Farm, who's farms director um, and yeah, general sustainable food campaigner and part of Piper's Farm, which has been going for 30 plus years, uh, bringing together small family farms to sell their produce online. Um, and just written a book about sustainable meat cooking. Um, and we've got Kitty uh, from Y Organic um, in the Y Valley, who's a first generation farmer and um, has set up from scratch. So you guys have been going 18 months um, selling meat, uh, veg and fresh flowers, um, all organic and pasture of life. And we're the cows that I look after at work and the cows that Kitty has are from the same breeding, so we're the unofficial traditional Hereford fan club here as well. <laughs> um, so I think we're going to split the uh, panel discussion into sort of three sections. Uh, we're going to start with how to get started, how to find your customers, um, and then take a few questions from you guys try and keep it a bit interactive and relevant um, and then we're going to talk about scaling up and software uh, ordering sort of deliveries versus local collection um, and then take a few questions and then we're going to finish on um, how to adapt and be resilient um, and yeah talk about really how every project is really quite different and unique um, so we'll get started <laughs> so if I can ask uh, Kitty first, because <laughs> Kitty has really, yeah, you guys have just started from scratch and you're using Ubi as well. Um, so how did you get started and where did you find your first customers? Um, so I started 18 months ago. The Market Garden was actually running for six months when I got there. Um, so I run the beef and sheep um, to do all the farming and do all the social media and the business side of it as well. Um, so we're in a profit share with the landowner. We only supply people within 15 miles of the farm. Really wanted um, local food for local people. So I wanted people to understand where their food comes from. I didn't want to sell to London restaurants. I know I could get more money, but I wanted people that real connection with where their food comes from. So, And logistically, it's a lot easier because we do the deliveries as well to be able to only deliver within 15 miles. We only do deliver two days a week. Um, so that was kind of the premise behind it. Keep it small, keep it local, and go from there. Um, yeah. yeah. Where did you find your first customers? Was it sort of friends and um, family or good local community, yeah, social media that brought them in? Yeah, so friends and family are great. Um, they're great to start with. They don't always stick with you, um, but they're great to get the... It's nice that they start. Um, the veg growers actually have two young children at the local school, and that has been an amazing source of customers um people that because you see that those parents every single day it keeps them in your mind and they're local you know they're local because the kids go to local school 
Um, veg boxes have been really good to get those customers hooked because veg is cheaper, it's local and it's fresh. People understand a veg box a lot more than they do a meat box. Um, so we kind of get them hooked with a veg box and they're like, oh, we also do meat and we also do fresh flowers and we can do it all under the same business. And yeah, that's kind of how we got in. And yeah, social media is great, especially because it's free. So how many, well, do you know roughly how many meat boxes you're selling at a start and where you are now? I remember my first sale was 250 gram pack of sausages to a campsite and I was so happy with that sale. It wasn't even our meat, we bought it in from a local farmer, but I was really happy because it was my first sale. Um, so yeah, now we'd, we've scaled up and we do um, subscription boxes. Um, so we're probably doing between 20 and 30 subscription boxes a week, as well as individual um, orders and a couple of pubs and restaurants um, and direct to butchers as well. Great. Um, Abby, it'd be great to hear a bit about uh, Piper's Farm. I know that you've been involved for about 12 years, is that right? Um, so about sort of, yeah, how it started, um, I guess where the first customers came from, um, yeah, and a little bit yeah. where you are now. So I didn't found the business. Luckily, we've got the founders sat right here. So Peter and Henry, um, they founded the business about 35 years ago. I joined the business about just coming up to 12 years ago. Um, and you know it was relatively established but it was very much focused we had a shop in the high street in exeter that was really where the majority of the sales were coming through um peter and henry were absolutely visionary with uh wanting to sell direct to consumer so really from the outset uh they would go to places like borough market and they would go and find customers all over the countryside they would do lots of food festivals and um, really talk about what was going on at, at the farm and they operated a mail order uh, service which was which was quite funny when you think it's only sort of 10 12 years ago but everything was paper based so when i joined the business thing you know you'd get orders coming in on fax machines and people ringing up and you'd have to try and hear was that chicken thighs or chicken pies did you want and you know it was where we are now where we're very much utilizing technology it's totally different but we can talk about that down the line um, but when I when I joined the business, I it wasn't very long uh, that I was there that I just realised that this was a huge untapped potential. You know, the magic of the family farms that I was privileged to be able to work with and sort of share their stories and see the passion and the care that was going into every single piece of food that we were producing, every single person in the team for the you know in our company that cared so much about the food that they were also taking part in producing. I felt like we've got to pick this up. We've got to get, if, if all of our customers could sit in the office and see what I see and walk on the farms and, and experience what I experience. And so for me very much, it was like, how can we tell that story? How can we pick up that magic and how can we get that out there? And then for those people that are looking for that sort of type of food and that food system, um, it felt like it, you know, they would sort of be like, you know, bees to the honeypot. So uh, I utilised a lot of things like social media to start with. Um, so really it was very much just opening that door and trying to make things as transparent as possible, trying to find a way that we could really honestly tell people what all the exciting things we were doing. Um, I think something that is is so vital, we can all get sort of distracted by tech and, you know, spending lots of money on advertising, but building genuine communities you know, is absolutely at the heart of what we do. So genuine relationships with our customers, genuine relationships with people within the sort of industry. So, you know, spending a lot of time with journalists, trying to get them to come to the farm, which isn't always easy. You know, it's ver a very London-centric market, but trying to get them out to Devon and come and see this magic. And then it's almost like that sort of is a catalyst to then inspire other people and then more people want to come and the kind of story rolls on from there. So. I was very lucky, you know, I, I haven't had the challenge that Kitty has had with a blank sheet of paper. I did walk into a, a business that had been going, you know, at that point for sort of 20 years. Um, but I think we very much, when I joined the business, it, we changed the way we did things. We really looked at how we can strengthen and develop that community and reach more people. And um, just one thing to not waffle on too much. But it isn't always about uh, customers, it's about making change as well. If we can share our story that then maybe that inspires another, uh, another farming business or another enterprise, like that is all for the good of what we're all trying to achieve as well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, the magic of the story, and I think so much of 
of this is about being human and being yourself and like uh, people aren't just buying your produce they're kind of buying into you and what you're doing on the farm and you know, that is absolutely central to it and I mean, I, I do some communications work and people often ask me what to write in their marketing emails. And I said, make sure it sounds like you, <laughs> not a robot. Talk about the farm with passion and the magic will come through. So, yeah, that's great. Um, Bob, it'd be great to hear a bit about how you got started. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so our, our, our start was slightly unusual because we arrived at the Apricot Centre September 2015. Um, that's in uh, uh, Totnes. Uh, in Devon, and um, we we set about putting it into organic conversion and putting it down to green manures and planting trees and all of that sort of thing. Um, our intention was to start growing reg um, uh, two springs later in, in 2017, um, once once the green manures and the biodynamic preps had done their had done their magic. Uh, but in uh, a year later, in in September 2016, um, we, we we started chickens, so we needed to sell them. Um, and uh, we got offered um, a veg round scheme from um, a, a, a local uh, a local organisation called Nature's Round. It was volunteer run. They were starting to starting to burn out. So they said, "Do you want to take over the veg box round? Here's a, here's a van. Here's a customer list, um, et cetera, et cetera." So there was like thirty to forty customers on that list, and uh, we didn't have any veg. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they had a model where they bought in um, from local trusted uh, people um, uh, and some bigger players like Riverford and um, Shillingford down the road. So we thought, yeah, why not? Let's give, let's uh, let's do that. So that when we when we do start growing veg um, six months later, we'll actually have a market already for our veg. So that was a that was a fantastic opportunity for us to uh, 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 to get going. Um, and then the same same thing happened the following summer. Because um, we wanted to do markets as well, uh, and I've been making friends um, with the with the uh, woman that run the uh, organic veg store on Totnes um, uh, Totnes Market on a Friday, and uh, she said she was getting burnt out, didn't want to go through another winter. Um, did uh, did did we want to take over her market? And that's really difficult to get in in on Totnes Market. So we kind of pretended that we were partners for a couple of couple of months or so, and did a did a kind of transition and then and then suddenly we were up and running uh, with the market um, but there's something about what uh, what 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 we now call uh, building social capital that was really important around that um, you know you might call it networking or just being friendly or, or whatever but uh, the the people that ran the uh, the veg box scheme um, uh, also run something called the squash cooperative in Totnes uh, and they just grow squash all over all over various different sites. And I went and volunteered and, and helped with them and stuff like that. Um, I didn't do it because I wanted their veg round at all. But, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, it was just networking with uh, unintended consequences, I guess. You know, just getting yourself getting yourself out there. I moved into Totnes uh, in September 2015. Didn't know anyone at all. Uh, so, you know, no, no friends or family to, uh, to, uh, to rely on. Um, so even though I was ridiculously busy on the farm, I was also, you know, out there volunteering and, um, you know, I chatted to the market Lady Dawn because um, I, ho I hoped one day we'd sell veg to them. But uh, uh, we ended up we ended up running the uh, run it running that stall as well. Um, yes, yeah, so that's how that's how we came about and got our first customers. Great. And Pete, it'd be great to hear a bit about Ubi and yeah, how you guys support people with getting new customers. <laughs> Thanks, Annie. Um, yeah, well, there's two parts, actually. We started from scratch uh, in ten 2010 doing a veg box scheme ourselves in New Zealand. And I think that, so the way we got started with our first customers was we created a bit of a noise around buying local and um, told on social media and we said that we were going to be releasing the first, you know, local food box, buying food from local farmers, and that people needed to get into a line, and we were going to only release 50 boxes, and that was that. And so we actually got a waiting list built first, which was great because our first day of delivery, we sold 50 boxes. Um, so that, that really worked. Um, and since then, we built the business, and we're running a box scheme ourselves for a close to 10 years and then having come over here when now um, those those businesses have been 
are now being operated and owned by the teams back in Australia and New Zealand. And now we are providing the software that we built over those 10 years to farms um, primarily and, and also food hubs to be able to do that direct um, sale to homes around their local region. Uh, so we've seen a lot of, uh, there's about 60 uh, farms running on the platform at the moment and have all come in at different stages, but there have been quite a few startups or very early stage um, um, uh, farms come on. And so I think the, the common theme seems to be around starting up. It's within your community, there will be a small niche of people who really get what you do. And they're the people who are probably going to come on soonest, come on first, and they're probably going to stick around for longest because they absolutely understand it, you know, from top to bottom, why you're doing what you're doing. And, and that's, I think of it in, as in concentric circles. So that's kind of your, your deep green circle right in the middle. It's a very small circle, but it's, it's your absolutely most loyal customers. And then, uh, and so to, to, to bring them on, you can offer a quite a simple offering. Um, and then the next concentric circle are going to be more concerned about, well, does it, you know, the convenience factor of it um, uh, and making sure that it works for them. And the next circle out is we're going to be more concerned about price and range and things. So starting small means you keep it really simple. And then as you expand your range and expand your service, um, then you can start to expand your customer base that way. Great. Should we take a couple of questions? Has anyone got any questions so far on finding first customers and how to get started? Got one at the back over here. Oh, yeah. We'll go to the back and then come forward. Thank you. What do you recommend starting growing with? If you're starting from scratch, are there more popular with your customers, the staple items, or would you concentrate on the profitable items that you still need? Um, maybe we should take that, I guess, starting from a meat perspective and then move on to a veg perspective. I, I would start with the things you're most passionate about, the products that you believe in most, the things that you think, this is bloody brilliant, this is delicious, this is wholesome, this like tastes amazing, I know people are gonna love this. That's where I would start. And then I would figure out sort of more of the kind of profitability stuff but you know around that but yeah definitely the thing that you really feel in your heart and soul that you want to give to other people is where i would start yeah um yeah i would start simple um don't start doing random fa fancy steaks that the odd person's going to get start with your mint start with your burgers start with those really accessible items because we are we're pasture fed and we're organic so we're already different to what you can get in the supermarket so don't take it too far out of the range of what people already know start small and then you can always expand but otherwise you can end up with things left over veg you have to throw away put it on the compost heap meat you have to eat yourself and there's only so much of a whole there's a lot of meat in a whole cow if you do a lot of different cuts then yeah there's a lot of yeah, i totally agree you don't want to end up with like four kilo ribs in the freezer that you can't sell and um, yeah so ideally things that you know they're gonna go quickly um, but we'll come on to a bit more of the logistics of that later um, Bob from a veg perspective what do you find sells well um, well we were we were offering veg bags so you know the, the idea behind a veg bag is it's got 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 a full range of uh, um, things to eat to, to, to keep a family or an individual or a couple going for a week so um, but we, we we sort of prioritize on potatoes onions uh, carrots and salad bags they go in nearly every week when they're when they're in season and um, we do a we do a salad bag pretty much every week of the whole year um, and um, in terms of you know market um, we, we, we sell 40 40 or so salad bags a week uh, these days so so salads are uh, a really good place to start relatively easy if you've got polytunnels that will make use of the polytunnel in the uh, in the winter as well um, and in terms of I know wholesale we do maybe 12 kilos of salad a week wholesale as well so uh, that's definitely a, a good place to start but we were looking for, for, for range so you know all your all your classic uh, uh, classic veg that, that people eat, eat seasonally so 
in the summer that's tomatoes french beans aubergines in the um tunnel stuff like that uh and then in the winter it's your, your sort of kales and cauliflowers and um purple sprouting broccoli comes in 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 in, in feb and march so that's a a really good thing there and and and, and of course all the roots as well yeah carrots, definitely what i'm hearing as well sometimes is starting with boxes helps you to balance what you're doing so yeah. rather if you offer a lot of individual products so cuts yeah. of meat or yeah. veg products it can become a bit of a logistical yeah. headache quite quickly so keeping it simple at the start having a box where people sign up for a box and then they get what they're given to an extent and it'll all be good stuff and they'll be happy with it. It, it helps on a meat perspective to balance the carcass so you know you're not going to get lots of leftovers and from a veg perspective it means if you've got a glut of one thing and yeah. less of another you, you can just balance it out. Yeah. Um, Pete, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I think um, to get started, if depending on if you're just starting your market garden, uh, probably to focus on the higher margin products like the salads, leafy greens and so on, but then to make sure that you, if you're not growing them yourself, that you're getting in the things like, you know, potatoes, carrots, onions, those base products to complement it out because that's what people will need to buy every week. And so you've got to have enough of a range to be attractive week after week after week. But if you're focusing on growing and you're just getting started, then go for the higher margin stuff. And the stuff that needs to be really fresh so that you're not having to sort of store it. You can literally harvest it, bag it, box it, and send it, you know, on the same morning. Uh, then you're going to blow their minds because, wow, it's so fresh. But they're also getting their staples yeah. from a trusted, you know, other, could be a neighbouring farm or something like that. Yeah, I totally think, yeah, I USP being fresh is good. Yeah, like, uh, USP is so key. Uh, just one thing to say on that, uh, you know, how do you start... It is a very, very crowded market already. You know, we can just see the amount of interest of, of people here um, that are that are engaged in this. There, you know, there are big companies, there are small companies, there are people that do it on a on a very, you know, with their honesty box down the end of their road, trying to find a way to cut through and talk to customers and grab customers, at, you know, early on. You do need to find something that is a USP, some sort, something that's really going to kind of connect and make them go, I won't drive to Tesco, Sainsbury's or any other available supermarket. You know, I won't buy my um, my salad from this place. I love this salad. Like, this is the salad that I feel so good about. I'm going to make the extra effort because, to be honest, when you guys first start out, your customers go are going to have to make effort to come to you. You know, you are not necessarily going to be the simplest choice. So really making sure you give them a compelling reason to come to you um, and make sure either you've got an absolutely stand-up product that is amazing or you really tell that story or you engage with them or you deliver excellent customer service. I think we can't forget the importance of like, you know, putting your best foot forward and finding something that's unique to you and your business that's really going to connect with your customers. Yeah, definitely. I think that's such a good point. And one thing as, as small farms delivering direct, I mean, it's as fresh as it comes sometimes. You can pick and deliver veg on the same day. You can get meat back from the butcher and have people picking up boxes the same day. And, and you just don't get that anywhere else. And, and if you've got good produce, it will really sell itself. Um, should we take one more question and then we'll move on? Hi there. Um, do you ever have a surplus? And if so, what do you do with it? Who wants to go, Bob? <laughs> um, yeah, with 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 veg, of course, of course, there's a surplus uh, occasionally. Um, so we built uh, a wholesale uh, market um, to absorb our sur surplus. Um, so shops, restaurants, um, things like that. Uh, and we 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 made it clear to them that our priorities was um, direct um, to the customer because you get more money, and that's that's when we want to build community that way. Uh, and they were happy with that. And um, uh, so our first, uh, um, well, our second August was was really interesting because we had about 70 customers. And then in August, everyone goes on holiday or they've got an allotment. And just when you've got your most veg, uh, our, our orders literally halved. Um, so because we built that relationship with um, uh, local shops and restaurants and stuff like that, we were we were able to to get rid of our, our surplus. Um, we do donate a little bit to something in Tottenham called Food and Community, 
um, which uh, absorbs fresh produce and distributes it. So there's, there's not many people that actually do that with fresh, fresh produce. So we're very happy to give stuff that comes back from the market if we can't sell it to the shops um, to them as well. Great. Yeah, I think diversity of outlets sometimes can be really good. I mean, where I work in a small way, I mean, we do hyper local like whatsapp group for the village and have 10 people coming to pick up veg um and then we supply some restaurants in sirencester but we actually often send surplus to the food bank as well so anything that doesn't sell from a friday if it sits in the fridge over the weekend i'll drop it off at the local food bank on monday and i think yeah there's a social capital as well and it can be part of your story and um particularly with veg when you suddenly get a lot <laughs> Uh, or you know, if someone can't pick up an order and you don't know what to do with it, um, it's great to be able to support other people to eat good food as well. On, on the meat front, I'm just going to put a voice in for the power of freezing. There's this bizarre thing with meat where people feel like, oh, if it's frozen, it's not as good. And actually, like I think we have to change that narrative to to really have a properly sustainable supply chain. Freezing is absolutely paramount um, in that carcass balance and that sustain. You know, you guys know the the way to balance the carcass. There will be things that go so much quicker than other things. It is inevitable if you're in meat production that you will have to ha like you know have that. And yes, the boxes is a kind of a way, but it's also a relatively inconvenient way for your customers to buy. Like the longevity of people buying boxes. If you if you look at those kind of data studies, they might come in on a box, but they don't tend to stick with them. So being able to offer those individual cuts and being able to give people what they actually want is really key. The way to do that is to freeze food. Um, and freezing is not, you know, we have done all of the trials and testing, as you can imagine. You have to look at it as, you know, we deal with whole, whole carcasses. We are waiting for that carcass to be absolutely at its perfect moment. We're looking at that going, right, this is the moment we're going to cut into that. It's like harvesting a beautiful fresh pea in a field and then instantly blast freezing it. You're actually locking in a lot of that flavor and nutrients. You're giving people that absolutely wonderful eating experience. And it's the best way of producing a kind of um, a properly sustainable supply chain, taking the pressure off yourself. Uh, and then being able to yeah to free up your time to do other things so yeah one just a sort of big big love for the for the freezer out there because it is it is so key in in me yeah totally agree kitty did you have anything to add? uh yeah i definitely agree with the freezer and also taking pre-orders um so you know what you're going to have what people want you don't cut everything up and you don't dice all your lamb shoulders and then someone comes in and wants a whole lamb shoulder and you're like oh, why did i do that um it's great if you've got it in the freezer but um, yeah, if you can get those pre-orders and then you know how to cut it up, that is a it's a real it reduces the waste you've got. And yeah, so we we have a pre-order, so I know what's going out fresh that week. And anything else that is going to be surplus, it is frozen the day it's butchered. So there is no there's no wastage there. It is as fresh as it can be. Um, it's not like oh I've put it in a fridge for a week and it doesn't sell. Then I put it in the freezer because I've got those pre-orders. I know exactly what is going out fresh and what is frozen. Great. I think maybe leading on from that, we'll talk a bit about scaling up. And I might ask Kitty just to talk a little bit about your marketing strategy, um, how you contact your customers. So I guess software, I know you guys are using Ubi, um, email marketing, social media, like what have been the tools that you've used to contact your customers and retain yeah. them and yeah, keep them on board? Yeah, so we've um, recently moved over to Ubi probably two months ago. Um, so we've got a website, all the, that's where everyone places their orders. Um, wholesale orders come in direct to us through emails or phone, but um, everyone, general public, order through the website. So all the information's on there. We also have a weekly newsletter. So we have meat, veg and flowers on the farm. So every week in that newsletter, the those specific farmers will write something in there, whether it's just something you had a hailstorm in the flower garden and this is what you had to do or something happened with the sheep that was funny. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the product, but it has to be about the story and get people engaged and th so they actually realise where their food comes from and they associate it with the farm or the people or something, not just that end product. Because you can go into Tesco's and all the products are there, but you don't know where it's coming from. So yeah, if you get people hooked on the farm and on you, then that yeah, that definitely really helps. Yeah, def uh, like keeping it visual, lots of pictures as well is yeah. really nice. Instagram is great. Um, people say, oh, Instagram's amazing, and they remember that, even if um, they're not buying something that week, but they'll see it, and it keeps you in their mind. Um, yeah, don't just show the good bits as well. Don't show the really bad bits. We don't show 
dead animals, but um, be real and realistic because people want that. They don't want a highlight reel. They want to see all the great bits and beautiful farm and amazing meat, but they want to see when it's snowing, your tractor's broken down and you are rolling out bales with my dad because he was the only one to help me. So they want to see and that, that just connects them with it. So yeah, social media is great and it's free. And also um, local Facebook groups, local villages, it's free to advertise on. You are advertising directly to who you want to um, buy your project. Um, we tried Google adverts, but just because we only deliver within 15 miles, it was just too widespread. You're paying for it and we actually weren't getting a return on investment. So yeah, Facebook advertising was so much better. Yeah, such a good point, kind of keeping it quite lean at the start. So, like, low investment, like, go local, look for community groups, schools, social media. There's actually yeah. so many tools that don't cost anything. Yeah, don't pay someone thousands of pounds to do a website. Don't do it. You can do it yourself. It's there's it's so easy. There's YouTube videos that show you how to do it. Don't pay someone thousands of pounds to do it. Abby. <laughs> I completely echo every honestly that just you've nailed it. I it, it is that thing, don't don't spend the money. Don't spend the money until you know that that's the right thing to do. But look work with all those free tools, build that community, explore all those avenues and um and only then when you really start to understand more about your customers and where to find them, then that's where you can sort of incrementally increase your your uh, potential investment. Test things, don't just sort of throw things at it and think it's going to work the first time don't be disheartened if it doesn't work the first time try it again do it in, in a different way you know the visual thing is really important um you know people are really fundamentally lazy these days they don't like to read a lot um and you know i spent years writing all these blogs and doing all this stuff and then when you actually looked at the data of how many people are really really reading it it was tiny and you think okay Whereas, you know, the visual side, if there's a way you can instantly connect, like through Instagram or just taking a really good photo, that's for me where, I mean, that was where we spent our, you know, first pounds was was hiring an amazing photographer who is a very dear friend of mine. And we have worked together for 10 years and, you know, led to a lovely cookbook and all these other things and the brand that you see today. That is the best money I probably have ever spent in marketing in the business um, to really tell the story of our producers over and above anything we've spent with yeah, Google. Because photos of meat, quite difficult. I mean, I've photos tried to take my own photos of meat. Very sexiest <laughs> thing to success. And, and yeah, when I, when I first came into the industry, the photos were of meat were like a white background with a nice piece of parsley or maybe someone had shaped a carrot next to it. And, you know, and that was it. And it was all, all sort of marketed as, you know, whatever, per kilo. And, and that's how it was kind of sold to, to customers. And I thought... I'm a customer, I don't, I look at this, I don't understand, is that gonna feed me and my other half? Is it gonna feed five of us? So trying to find a way where you can visually tell the story, like show people what it looks like when it's cooked as well, you know, inspire them, create recipes, like all of that stuff that you can do um, and share. And the other thing to say in terms of like, you know, tools, go where your customers are. Like when you start to build a bit of a kind of understanding of, of who's coming, even if it is just friends and family, find more of them you know just try and think where are they going to be and then go there and if that is you know your parish magazine or um school events like schools are quite brilliant we're doing barbecues and bake sales and all sorts of things go there don't be afraid to start small don't feel like you've got to launch yourself straight into the world of google i mean i would avoid it like the plague all of that stuff because um it comes with all sorts of other challenges but yeah utilize your community and think think about the um think about the how your customer is perceiving you at all times great bob <laughs> uh yep so definitely all of that um our our top facebook post ever was when when we lost a cow um so yeah people enjoy reading about people enjoy reading about disasters don't they and <laughs> all, the, all of that sort of thing yeah on honesty to an extent yeah, it's yeah. definitely really good yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Uh, people engage with it yeah we did find it in the end <laughs> um so Chasing cows around too. Yeah, works yeah. Well. Just uh, so, just to add some, some something slightly different to, to all of that, which is which is really important for us. Um, actually, sort of the underlying sort of systems and processes are, are really important. When when I took on that veg round, um, it was spreadsheet based. It was it was really hard work. It was really labour intensive. There was lots of manual error because I was updating uh, customer balances all the time. And you know, if you do fifty of them in and do it in 10 minutes you're going to get a couple wrong 
Um, so uh, moving to uh, uh, an online platform where people could actually go and uh, order was a was a was a, was a really key moment. I don't think I could have done more than about 50, 50 or sixty customers uh, weekly um, without without technology. Um, so uh, so that wasn't Ubi. We moved to Ubi a, 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 a couple of years later than that. It was it was something else, but it was it, it, uh, it was just as good and. That that took a lot of the processing, you know. It does 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 billing. It takes it takes balances from customers' accounts and stuff like that. So it, uh, it, it reduced the time that we had to uh, um, that we had to uh, uh, do uh, all of those tasks. So we could we could focus on on marketing and doing doing all those other things. Um, and then just one other point: if 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 someone could engineer another pandemic, uh, that would be amazing. <laughs> we went from 70 customers to 250 customers a week in um, in about two weeks. Just goes to show if people value their food yeah. <laughs> and they're really thinking yeah. about where their food comes from. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's there. <laughs> uh, about 150. So yeah, yeah. So we so so, so we doubled, um, and that's a very common story with veg boxes. Um, they were the they were the people that just didn't want to go to supermarkets. Um, uh, because they didn't want to get ill, and then and then they they went back to the supermarkets, which was a shame. But we did we did we did change a significant number of people's uh, hearts and minds on because of it. Great hearts and minds, definitely. <laughs> uh, Pete. Yeah. So the question is around scaling, sort of going from a first set of customers to the, a larger. Okay. So I guess there's two sides to it. There's the sale side of it, and then there's the actual delivering and satisfying the sale. Um, on the on the sale side of it, the what seems to be the three pillars are word of mouth, um, online, and in person. And word of mouth is always a winning. You know, th we've got these surveys that you can set up when people are signing up, which ask people, "How did you hear about us?" And word of mouth is always you know, the, the highest um, in terms of getting new customers. The other is online, and that breaks down to uh, either social media, which again, keep it really visual and just keep the content rolling because people just get familiar and feel comfortable with what they're familiar with and they can build a relationship with you through that or a, a sort of a quasi relationship. Um, and then the other part of online is search, like not paid advertising so much, but just making sure that the, the site is optimized so that when someone is searching for anything like what you're offering, that you end up at the, at the top. Um, because again, when we look at those surveys, it's usually word of mouth, found you on Google or Facebook, you know, or, or Instagram or one of the socials. So they're the real pillars. And then in terms of the actual scaling you know you could it's it's easy enough to sell your first box to somebody because you're selling an idea in their head and they're like oh i like that idea and it's great it's the second and subsequent boxes that are harder if you don't deliver on time in full charge the right amount um, answer their question quickly or have the information at hand so that they don't have to ask you the question so the the logistics and the coordination of your operation is a really big part of your sales because that's what that comes down to retention. And if you're only adding one or two customers a month, but you've got really good retention, then you're going to grow. But if you're dropping off three or four customers and you're adding three or four, then you're not growing. Thanks. That's really great. <laughs> um, should we take a couple of questions? We go at the front. <laughs> Oh, well, Mike's coming. <laughs> what do you think your kind of average subscription time is? As it, presumably people are dropping in and out all the time. It depends on how long you've been running. Like we, we keep the data on that to say what's your average lifetime value of a customer. Um, the longer you're running, the longer that goes because you've got some customers that are just super loyal. Um, so it, you, the answer is, you know, it, it changes over time. But let's say you've been running for a year. You're probably, on average, going to be having an average lifetime value of 12 to 15 weeks. 
per customer. Some are going to come on, have one box and then leave. Others are going to stay for a longer period of time. But again, there's so many different variables that affect how long customers stay on. You know, the quality of your food, your service, all sorts of things. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's almost an impossible question. It's so dependent on your business. Um, like, you know, with us, and it also depends on uh, like our lifetime value and our average order value and all of that stuff changes year on year. That can be impacted from what's going on globally in the world, from news. You know, it's it's so dependent what products you're selling and like you know, like you said, the service that you offer and, and that sort of thing. I think what you guys need to try and if you're sort of looking at taking on this journey is what works for you. Like you obviously want to recruit your best customers. You obviously want to have people that buy regularly from you and you build that relationship. And so it's finding ways that you can kind of deliver that and do that. Um, and then it's trying to sort of spot the bits where maybe that you're, you know, we've all got gaps in things where maybe you're not delivering the best. So whether it's like, okay, we need to improve customer service or we need to improve delivery. We'll talk about the big scary delivery because I know that puts off a lot of people. Um, and try and really refine those processes because, you know, we want that number to be as high as possible. Great. Should you another question here at the front? Thank you. Um, if you grow your business, you get bigger and then you become an employer as opposed to self-employed. Uh, do you recruit full-time workers, seasonal workers? Do you uh, have students? Do you um, even get migrant labourers? Um, what you could you say about the problems that you have faced in terms of as you grow your company. Bob? Me to go. Uh, yeah, so we so so we've 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 grown quite quite rapidly. Um when, when I first first started doing that round, um I did it all. Uh uh I, I did all the sourcing, all the customer work, um uh the driving, the packing, you know, absolutely everything. Um uh, we've now got a, a farm team of, of, of nine FTE. Um nearly all of them are full time. Um because certainly on the on the growing side um, we don't really want seasonal workers um, because we don't want to have to to re-recruit them um, uh, every year. So so we try and um, keep them busy. Obviously, there is more work in the summer, but we have a model where we do pr um, uh, um, jams and preserves and chutneys and stuff like that. So all of the all of the fruit that doesn't get sold or is slightly blemished or something like that goes in the freezer, uh, and then that uh, we we pull that out of the freezer and um, uh, and, and make stuff with it um, in the um uh in the winter months so that's great um we the only part-time roles we have are uh, is a driver um who's very happy to work part-time around other wo uh, uh, other work one of our challenges with that is when the driver wants a holiday um because <laughs> covering driving is is a is a nightmare you know it just takes twice as long you know with the best will in the world you, you, with sat nav and all of that sort of thing it still takes it still takes ages um, so that's one of our challenges. I did have two drivers at one point, um, and they covered each other's holidays, which was great. But um, uh, but uh, they moved on to other things, um, and a, and a, and a pack, pack house role um, is uh, part time as well because the because the work's part time. But she's very happy with that around her her her, her work balance. But the other thing I want to say about this is to is to is to not be afraid to. To, to replace yourself, <laughs> um, it often works much better. Uh, so myself and, and, and Marina, who I work with, are, um, are really busy um, on uh, on the farm and doing education and consultancy work and and stuff like that. I was doing veg around logistics, which was you know half of my week at least, so I wasn't able to do much of that stuff. Um, Marina did the markets, which was most best part of Thursday and and Friday. Um, so we took on a sales supervisor. We called it called Claire. Um, to do all of that work, uh, and that freed our headspace enormously to be able to um, to go off and you know I come come to things like this, which I could never never ever do because I was always having to be there um, all week every week. And of course, because she's full time and focusing on it, she's doing she's doing a much better job. Great, yeah, no, I, I totally hear that. I used to do direct sales on top of running a farm in my previous job. It is a lot of work, and you're on the farm chasing cows around and then you're packing a meat box and you need to go and get changed in between and there just isn't time for that so it's and then doing deliveries there's so many facets to it actually it is great to have other people to help as you 
get bigger and I guess Kitty I wanted to ask is probably you and James do everything and do you have support with deliveries do you're you're doing your sheep your cattle yeah um so we do everything except for the deliveries but because we share a delivery driver with the veg and the flowers um so I would say pick when you get to the point where you need help pick what you need help with and employ someone to do the 10 pound an hour jobs not the 50 pound an hour jobs free up yourself to do that and it is really difficult for farmers to give up that control if they've been doing everything um especially at at the start of it you're going to get problems because they're not used to the system or they're doing it differently you just have to work through that and not go well i'm just going to carry on i'm going to do it all because you can't do it all when you scale up um so yeah we're on that precipice we are still doing pretty much everything except for the delivery driving but um, on the veg side of it, they've got um, a part-time, for the veg grower, there's a, fu- there's a full-time and a, um, a part-time who does five days a week during the summer and then down to two or three days a week in the winter. Um, so getting someone that is flexible, um, but then we've got a seasonal flower grower that just comes in for the summer months because there's just not enough work for them in the winter. Um, I think we might move on to our last section because we've got 15 minutes left. <laughs> Uh, so we talk a little bit about um, adapting. I guess we've touched on these themes a bit all the way through, but kind of how to build resilience uh, into your direct sales and adapting and collaborating and the what not to do's and the what to do's. <laughs> um, and I guess if we go to Pete, um, how do you feel like you've adapted? What sort of big challenges have you overcome? Yeah, I the two types of adapting is adapting as you grow to be able to cater to customers that maybe are more demanding or expect more and um, a few examples are having the ability for customers to you know exclude something that they don't like or that they might be allergic to and having to sort of adapt to that to their needs Um, you know the the customers that want to be able to book in holidays and know that they're not going to be receiving a box while they're away and things like that. They're, they're more just features of ensuring that you're satisfying those, those you know, broader sort of range of customers. Um, but then, and then there's a, a sort of adapting through time. Um, there's always new things happening in the market and it's an evolving space and um, you've got to be keeping up with what the trends are and what people are expecting. So there'll always be new entrants coming in and offering a new fancy thing. Uh, and I think that if you if you feel like that you you know you can't you've just got to keep doing what you're doing, that you might find that you'll start falling behind. So always thinking about how can we create a new kind of offering, a new kind of bundle or something that's going how can we partner with someone else to be able to bring something new and fresh to your offering um because yeah that's that's the world of the world of the food business anyway it's a it's a constantly changing palette it's almost like fashion right you got to be evolving but also staying true to your real to your real roots as to what it is that you know you're delivering uh but i guess it depends on what you're facing too situational if if for whatever reason things aren't working like the way they used to then you've got to think it through you've got to get creative and you say oh, what's going on and ask your customers you know, listen to them and find out where, what are those paths towards something new and innovative that they're going to love great Bob thanks uh, so um, partnering and collaborating um, is quite important to us uh, in, in Devon there's something called the good food loop uh, and that is uh, that enables me to uh to sell produce on uh, uh, in um, Plymouth um, using a, uh, a company called Tamar Grow Local, um, uh, so that's so, th- so that's a Plymouth audience that we can reach. Uh, there's one in Exeter, um, and there's uh, one um, in the Sidmouth area. Um, so that's that's way beyond our delivery capability to get to all those places. Um, so that uses a. Uh, uh, a website called the Open Food Network, um, so I can just list my products on the Open Food Network. Um, and then what the Good Food Loop actually really is, uh, is a van that um, starts in Plymouth, 
um, brings us produce that we might have ordered from um, from growers in in, in Plymouth. Um, comes comes and picks up our orders, takes it to Exeter, and then another van comes from uh, um, from from Sidmouth and intersects with it. Um, so uh, and then obviously there's fees. There's a there's a, there's a ten percent fee on that and on all of that sort of thing. But uh, but I sell more flour, for example. Um, through through those websites than I do on my own website, so um, it's just giving me an, uh, uh, additional markets, which is which is amazing. Um, and then the only other thing to say about adapting is is to is to get to get extras to get stuff into your uh, um, uh, um, into your um, ordering system. So uh, we list bread, we list cheese, we list we list milk, all carefully selected, obviously. Um, uh, um, artisan and organic products and all of those kind of things, but uh, you know that that might push the average spend up, sort of from fifteen pounds to per nineteen pounds per customer, which is obviously obviously important. Great, Abby. I'm I'm going to contradict myself here, but I'm going to do it on purpose. I think from the outset, the most important thing you can do when you're starting this journey is be very clear about what you're wanting to achieve. So what what are your beliefs what what's your mission statement what are you there to do and write that down and make that a sort of commitment to yourself and to your future employees and to your customers um, and be very clear about what what that is what's your place what what are you trying to solve for your customers how are you trying to improve their experience whether that's you know the food they're eating or the experience of buying from you Literally, if you can carve it in stone or, or cement it and make that a rule that you live by in your business, and that is something that is is the sort of um, the uh, the pillar that you build your business upon. And then when you are then looking to adapt, you've got something to come back to. Because what can happen when you're on this journey is it can be very easy to get distracted by trends or you know feel the pressure of what other people are doing or you know the competition is now doing that. People are saying this. And you can sort of move away from actually what is at the heart of your business quite easily. Whereas if you always have that thing to come back to, it will help you guide you on your journey of adaptation. And so, you know, we've, we've and this is where I contradict myself, because we have done many things over the years. We've had shops, we've delivered to chefs and wholesale, uh, we've done online, we've tried all these different routes to market. But the one thing that has never, ever changed in that adaption process has been our, our mission of why we're here and what we're doing and what products we believe in and our sort of system of supporting small-scale family farmers so whichever route we go down we always have that as sort of all, almost like our compass and I think that's really important when you start out that you take time to think about that. Great. Kitty? Yeah I definitely agree with that so our core for our business was um, local food for the local community um, and connecting people to where their food comes from um, so by selling direct to the consumer rather than just to a butcher or selling it to the market. Um, so that has stayed the same, but how we do that has changed uh, as in what we offer. So we, we listen to the customer, but we don't let them dictate our business because we need them for our business, but also it's, yeah, we don't want that to just distract that from what we essentially set out to do. Um, so we set out just delivering to local people. We don't didn't have a, um, pick up point but we're now looking at doing a pick up point in the village um, we don't want it on the farm but uh, so many customers want that um, and there's so many customers that we could then access if we did offer a pick up service slightly out of our 15 mile range it's not going to be people from Bristol or London it's still going to be people in the local vicinity but it's going to be people that we weren't currently accessing um, with our one driver that drives the farm truck because our delivery van broke down. <laughs> Great. Um, check how much time we've got left. We've got five minutes. We'll take a few final questions. Uh, someone here. Hi there. Uh, um, I uh, run a, a, a market garden in Sheffield and uh, my question is around marketing on the bigger scale. Um, and we're on the Ubi network, and uh, but we're one now of, of four uh, hubs in Sheffield, Ubi hubs, and uh, between us we probably uh, deliver around about 1,200 um, deliveries a week uh, in Sheffield. But that's in a population of about half a million people, so it's still very much a drop in the ocean. And, uh, and I drive around in a in a van that says organic, Sheffield grown, farm fresh to your door, and I'm always wondering, well. 
why aren't people battering on my on my van door saying I want your produce? And I think the question is, we're we're market marketing against uh, um, the bigger powers of the supermarkets, and so collectively in somewhere like Sheffield, how can we promote the organic local message in a way that will benefit all of the different um, providers, the local providers? So, and is that something that perhaps Ubi could be a part of enabling that? Uh, so that's the question. Yeah, it is a conundrum. I mean, it's y what you guys are offering and, and all of the local hubs are offering is something that is a no-brainer, right? Everyone should want it. Uh, but I think that ultimately there are the people who are tuned in and then the people who aren't tuned in. And the tuned in people are on, they're already your customers. So there's an art to getting a message across to the people who are not yet tuned in or on the edge um, and that it's it's something that a t an average farmer who's got a really strong skill set in farming can't have the time to get to know the skills and the art of influence, I suppose, in when it comes to marketing. Uh, yeah, it is definitely a thing that we've talked about, and we've just Kelly, who's at the back of the room today, she's um she's just joined the team and has a very strong marketing background with, and we're working on ways that we can help to sort of narrate a story on your behalf um, and not a, you know, a story about, say, Moss Valley Market Garden, but wrap that around a general story that can penetrate you know, the people that are on the edge of thinking about this, but they don't quite know that they want it yet. So yeah, I think that there is a real opportunity to, to elevate you know, the, um, the awareness and the message in a way that is professional, in a way that people feel like I can trust it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a big challenge, but I think it's one that we can we can definitely contribute to. Yep. Should we take one more question at the back? <laughs> uh, so my question is about social media in terms of using it as a str uh, strategy within your marketing campaign. Um, it's twofold, really. Firstly, what further intel can you gain from the customers you already have in terms of their engagement with social media and using that to build a profile of finding new customers? And then secondly, how do you distinguish between genuine customers and people like us, enthusiasts, to your site or to your Facebook uh, or Instagram, etc.? Yeah, I guess, are you doing any metrics tracking or is that something that you're thinking about? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I can. I can respond. I mean, um, we haven't actually done that much yet in that space. You know, we've been far more focusing on operational. But I do understand. You know, the the basically the profiling of the existing customers and then saying who else out there is like our existing customers and and how do I find them and how do I reach them? Uh, I think there's there's definitely a way that we could be that we could be assessing who those customers are and what their traits are to be able to do that um, it's a it's a the point is every every hub th the customers are their customers it's like it's not we we don't you know that it's not our data it's the data of each each farm or uh, that's doing so we need to be you know mindful of that um, and in terms of distinguishing between an enthusiast that's kind of just Going, wow, that's amazing, but they're not really that into it. And they only, really, the only way to distinguish is how long they're there for, um, assuming that you've delivered a, you've delivered what you say you're going to deliver. Um, so, you know, you we but quickly you could build up a, a profile of right. These are the long-standing customers. These are the one or two box customers. What's what are these guys having in common? What are these guys having in common? And you could start to profile out that way. Yeah, just to add that. So, we track every metric under the sun. Uh, you know, the scale we're at, we track every single number you could ever possibly track. We know everything that we can possibly know. If there's a way of getting that information, we'll get that information. Do we use all of it? No, we do not. 
And that is the thing, you can drown in data. There is some data that is so helpful and there is some data that is just gonna take you down a rabbit hole and you're just gonna fill yourself with more questions than you have answers to. I think when you when you um, consider data, it's the same approach when you know if we're talking about on a farm. There's there's the sort of data that we're mapping with maybe um, if you're using something like soil mentor and you're really tracking things, and then there's that farmer, the farmer led data where you go actually I can see that the hedgerows are, are wider, the grass is growing quicker, and I think it's that thing of like what is your real experience so what is that what are the things that you're genuinely seeing are you seeing uh, are you seeing more customers picking up the phone are you getting more email inquiries can you look at that rather than kind of hiding behind some of the numbers and the, the worrying thing about social media is um you know the algorithms and how much uh, how much information that you cannot access and how much of it is falsified as well it, it you know social media has changed when i first started out with pipers 10 years ago uh, 10 plus years ago, it was an amazing tool for attracting customers. You had very clear insight into what that customer was doing. Uh, quite a lot of that, that data is now hidden and quite a lot of it actually isn't really reflective. The reach is, m you know, we have something like 45,000 followers on social, uh, but I think now your average reach is about 4% of your followers. Um, and so, you know, don't get lost in the data. Uh, Use it as a sort of shadow to guide you, but use your real life experience and that sort of visual feeling and knowing how much is going out the door at the end of the week to really guide you. Yeah, I think that's great. I think we're, we're going to end here. I just want to say thank you so much to everybody. You've been really generous with your knowledge. And I just think it's really fascinating how every project is so different, so unique. Everyone who starts this kind of thing on top of a farming business or um, market garden, you all take your own path, it's your own journey and you have your sort of central pillar but you have your adaptations and being flexible is super important as well and you know, I think you learn very fast <laughs> what to do and what to do next just by trying things. Don't be afraid to do it, it's a lot of work, make sure you're aware of how much you know time you've got to actually put into something like this but you can really add value to what you're doing and Seeing your produce go out to customers, and I can speak from my own experience, is really special. Eating beef or veg that you've produced in a restaurant cooked by a chef, coolest thing ever. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I'd really encourage you to have a go. And thank you very much. <laughs>